Hey everyone and welcome back to another industry report. So, you know when you like something, right, and all is going well, but then suddenly the sequel is a grindy free-to-play disaster waiting to happen. A lovely feeling, you know, all too often we see beloved IP series follow the money, chase wider audiences, and they end up losing that which made them so special in the first place. This was to be the fate of Torchlight Frontiers, a follow-up to the successful Torchlight series of ARPGs, but no longer. This story is a true win, and it's one that is important that we all know about. Of course, if you're new here, then hello, we do six videos a week covering game industry analysis, and if you're not new here, then um, hey, smash that like button to help the algorithm out, and with that, let's get into the story. So the fantastic first Torchlight game released amidst a drought of ARPGs in 2009, and it caught that wave of post-Orange Box Steam users. It's super well. It earned a lot of fans because it had great player focus focused features, like it had a netbook mode. Remember netbooks? And it had mod support. And the devs, like they were celebrated veterans of the industry and the genre. I mean, in large part, they were the ex-Diablo developers of Blizzard North. So a really good story. Then Torchlight 2 was also a successful game, following up on the victories of the original and adding in uh, multiplayer and a bunch of other features that people liked. And combined, it's about 5 million sales. After that though, Runic Games made Hob and they dissolved in 2017. Now, Perfect World, their owners, basically since 2010, canned them so they could focus on games as a service. Now, during Hobbs' development, Blizzard North and Runic founder Max Schaefer left to found another Perfect World studio, Entra Games. Now, this team is comprised of Diablo and Torchlight developers, and they started to work on, well, the next thing for Torchlight, Torchlight Frontiers. So... Perfect World, the notorious publisher, they were focusing on games as a service, and they greenlit a new studio They hired loads of industry, like veteran devs, to follow up on Torchlight. And yeah, we all know what happened next. Torchlight Frontiers was announced as a free-to-play action RPG in 2018, and according to closed alpha testers, like, it did actually contain most of the Torchlight DNA. It had fantastic basic combat. The issue, though, is there was still a free-to-play game, and that means that they had to monetize it somehow, so yes, it had a cosmetic cash shop, it had seasonal battle passes, and it featured horizontal progression that felt very half-baked, and very much against the core of Torchlight's design. Now, basically, right? These titular frontiers. They were areas, but each area had its own progression. So if you move from one themed area to another one, like to another frontier, that essentially was a full character reset. Your gear earned in one frontier couldn't be taken to another one, and that made the game feel terrible according to alpha testers, and it's obviously something in there for the grindy free-to-play longevity. And it sounds like a normal story so far, doesn't it? A publisher, one notorious for F2P, snaps up a beloved studio and forces a business model on them. I mean, on paper, Paper, in a way, it might not be a terrible idea. Path of Exile is a free-to-play ARPG with uh, seasonal elements, a cash shop with cosmetics, but if you could trust Perfect World, and I mean, obviously, you just have to look at what they've done in the past, you know, if you could trust them to actually keep that balance. And then also, it was an exclusivity story that flew under the radar, because the first two games were on Steam, you could pretty much get them anywhere, but uh, no, Frontiers was only going to be available on Perfect World's ARC platform that is for free-to-play games. Now, here's the story. There's been an astonishingly good development here, and this is to the joy of anyone who wants more Torchlight, more ARPGs. Those plans that I just talked about, they are dead. Out of nowhere, the developers announced that Torchlight Frontiers is now Torchlight 3. It is a premium game, and it's coming to Steam. They are removing that horizontal progression, they're adding in a new and improved story elements, and they are dramatically improving the pacing of the game. And their update post begins saying, it's like a new game, and openly admits, the grind is gone. They have shifted the game so that frontiers don't lock out your gear, and characters have got one single level instead of a per frontier level. It's now a linear ARPG with balanced progression and no extra monetization past its initial box cost. And if you look at their FAQ, they plainly state there is no longer an in-game shop. Now, the studio lead, Max Schaefer, took to YouTube in a video to announce this and to explain why. And pretty much, it's all about the feedback. Most of the reason that they changed this was the alpha testers' feedback. The alpha testers told the team what they wanted Torchlight to actually be, and, uh, well, the developers ultimately agreed with them and were able to, f like, get that change actually implemented. Now, they announced loads of changes that will be hitting the alpha soon, and they dropped a massive patch, the one that pretty much turns the game into Torchlight 3. And it's actually 
actually a really interesting video because based on its delivery, I think it's kind of a battle of publisher versus developer. I mean, thanks to the backup of the alpha testers and loyal fans, it seems like the devs basically won here. It sounds like the team weren't that happy with how Frontiers was turning out, but you know, they knew what direction they should take. I mean, come on, look at look at the people we're, we're dealing with here, right? They're veterans of the genre. They sold like 5 million games between the last two Torch sites. They'll know what the crack is for making a good ARPG. And they'll know they're trying to sacrifice a whole bunch of that core stuff in order to make a wider audience free to play version of it is just not a great idea. Plus, I mean, there's some unnecessary risk there. And also the, like, the small issue of Path of Exile. I mean, the ARPG market is doing well, but trying to muscle in and they're free to play turf, like, Path of Exile is the reigning king, and I'd say that would be a foolish decision for them to make. And I think it's that thing where often you'll have a really strong core audience, but then, you know, an expansion of that will be attempted in order to bring in more sales. Because there's usually that thing with a lot of games where, you know, maybe you've got four games in a series, game one or two do really well, but then they sort of start to tail off. So it's always that balancing act for publishers, but a lot of the time, a publisher will have their wider top-down strategy that they'll just be trying to put on everything that they do. And you see this, like games as a service for, um, you know, for EA. Uh, you maybe see it with Ubisoft, who've been doing games as a service, but have also, you know, they really pushed those really big open world games. And you saw those top-down decisions sort of hit games in their portfolio where they weren't really welcome. Now, yes, a free-to-play action RPG is totally possible, but from what we understand of Frontiers, uh, the initial version of it, yeah, it really wasn't working out that well. And it's a great example of just sometimes publishers don't know what's best, and there's a reason why they're the ones doing the publishing, and the developers are the one doing the developing. And perhaps this is a case where the, de the devs had enough backup that they could take their arguments to the publisher and say, hey, all of our alpha testers basically want this. And they can then actually win that argument with the publisher and, you know, sort of affect the change that they want to make. And seemingly, that is Torchlight 3. And to me, this really is just so heartening. There's so many times where even there's a beloved series and it comes back, but it's just different from what that series' essence is. And it's almost always just chasing the money and chasing a wider, less core audience. So really, that's what player feedback is for. Quality feedback can be rare, but if you've got a dedicated audience and you can really prove that you are willing to listen to them as the Torchlight devs have, then yeah, they can be impossibly, they're just, you know, it's hard to comprehend just how helpful they can be in like actually winning. Really, it is understanding exactly exactly what ARPG players want and then giving it to them that is the core of doing well in that genre. And in this case, I mean the team's pedigree being original Blizzard North developers. It's quite funny to me because, you know, it's old Blizz versus new Blizz. New Blizz is uh, certainly a lot less player focused. I, I think that's, I mean, if you're a World of Warcraft player, I think that much is fairly obvious. They seem to do a lot of things that are not necessarily for the player's benefit. Uh, they just seem to get a bit muddled. And then in other things that Blizzard do, I mean, yeah, they're different from the old Blizzard. Yeah, seemingly this is a case where a bunch of old Blizzard devs and, you know, Blizz North who turned into Runic and then are now this team, it seems like they were almost having their publisher forcing them to not really be Blizzardy in their, you know, DNA, but by actually listening to the players and really just showing the core of those old Blizzard values, they made it happen. I mean, think about StarCraft. StarCraft is one of my favorite games. StarCraft 2 is probably, I mean, in my top five favorite games of all time. But for the original StarCraft, whenever it first uh, was shown off by Blizzard, the fans kind of ridicule them. They say, hey, this is Warcraft in space. This isn't really what we want. What are you, what are you actually doing? And then Blizzard, in what seems like a bit of a Herculean effort, uh, pretty much revamped that entire game and made it StarCraft. They listened, and that is what led to things actually turning out well. And I think you're going to see a little bit of a repeat of that. You're going to see this sort of follow the money, free to play game. The fans resoundingly say, no, that's not what we want. Come on, you know what's up and then they actually change it. And that really is just that core Blizzard essence shining through. And sadly, something that's a lot more lost in modern Blizzard. And if you're more interested in that, watch tomorrow's video. Like, hit that sub button. Tomorrow's video is going to be a good one because honestly, the Warcraft 3 Reforged situation is basically scandalous. Like, they have, they have literally sold that game on lies. It is... It is downright despicable and completely against the core of what Blizzard means in the hearts of most gamers who ended up loving that company for their early work. And you know, I suppose with ARPGs being such a classic genre, it's just kind of funny, right? Like it's a classic thing. You know, it's like 90s, super focused and this is the essence of our game. This is the gameplay. It is just a focused design for the people who love it. And you know, just back to that era, it's just a bunch of people making games. They go out, 
the kind of, a lot of those external influences of the modern market weren't really there. And, you know, you look at what Frontiers was going to be, it wouldn't have been respecting players' time, would have been using the psychological tricks and traps, all that stuff, and now it's gone. And this is such a win. And thankfully, the community response has been so very positive to this. This is clearly what Torchlight players wanted all along, and it just took time and high-quality feedback for the devs and the players to convince Perfect World of this. That seems obvious to me. And this is the importance of feedback. I would say, if you really want to make some change, arm the developers with a way to argue with their publisher to actually get the change that you as a player want to see. But one thing that I, I think is fairly certain in a lot of cases is you have developers who have got into this industry because they love games, because they love these genres. And they get into these companies and, you know, they're not in a role where they get to make all of the decisions. So I think you do end up in these cases where you've got developers, maybe they're working in a core gameplay loop that they absolutely adore. I'm sure that was the case for Torchlight Frontiers, which supposedly had excellent combat in its alpha version. But then you've got those developers sort of having to do some things they don't like. Or maybe they're doing the bit of the game that they love but it's maybe in service of an overall whole that they don't really like that much or that they have mixed feelings about. And I think, you know, the, the gaming population has got to understand that's what most devs are going to end up feeling and thinking. But if we can actually give lots of good targeted feedback to the developers, to the community managers, and to the publishers, then, you know, the, the few developers who actually end up in those meetings with the publishers, they're able to say, listen, publisher, literally all the feedback that we've got is saying that what you want is not a good idea. Can we please make some changes? And the more data points those devs have, the better they're able to make those arguments. And that is why we've got to be, I would say, actually, you know, a bit positive. We've got to say, we don't like this, this is why, and this is what we want. And I think that's what we should just be doing pretty much all the time whenever these stories happen. And this, I wanted to just go in deep in this story, to properly raise it up, to make sure that people know about it, because even if you are not an ARPG fan, this story matters. This is what we want to see happen more. The more that things like this happen, the better this industry is going to be. And with that, I think I've said my piece. I would love to know what you've got to say about this story down below. Uh, hit that sub button tomorrow, though. We are going to be covering the darker side of when bad things happen, because Warcraft 3 reforged and uh, basically things not necessarily being that true. A whole big mess. So stay tuned for that tomorrow. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.